Welcome everyone, welcome back to the third keynote of our IST conference. My name is Caroline Rogge and it's my real pleasure to moderate this keynote with Professor Lea Fünfschilling. Lea Fünfschilling is assistant professor at the University of Lund in Sweden and is based at CIRCLE, um, the research unit for innovation studies. Um, she did her PhD in sociology in Switzerland at the University of Basel, and she looked at institutions, actors, and technology in interaction. Leah is going to talk about our conference theme and her reflections on this theme. Leah is an active member of the STRN board, and um, she has also been playing a leading role in the Swedish platform for transformative innovation policy. Um, Lea is also um, one of the organizers of the Method School for PhD students of the SDRN community, so you may know her from that. Well, with that, um, I also want to say for her keynote, um, we will again have our graphic illustrator, um, Heiko, Heiko Stöber, who will um, summarize her talk, and later on you can see the result. Lea, a warm welcome to you. Um, Thank I'm you really very much, much, Carolina. I'm very much looking forward to your talk and to your reflections on our conference theme. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. And hi, everybody. Um, thanks for having me to uh, reflect a little bit on uh, the conference theme. And uh, especially, I think it's a good opportunity to do that at the end of the conference, where I also got a lot of new impressions. And uh, thanks to all of you for sharing your research. Um, so I will talk, as said, about the conference theme, and that is mainstreaming transitions from research to impact. And I will kind of dissect that a little bit. So I will talk about mainstreaming, I will talk about research, and I will talk about impact. And in between, there's, of course, the big question of, of transitions. But I thought, at least at this conference, I don't have to go in depth into what that is. So let's get started with the question of mainstreaming. Let's see if this works. Yes, perfect. Um, as you all know, this is a big topic in various social sciences and also within the transitions community. Many people have uh, tried to conceptualize mainstreaming and there have been various attempts coming from sociology, institutional theory, organization studies, um, STS and others uh, to try to understand how things become mainstream. So let's take a closer look at what that is, and I will add um, generally reflections um, that are just of sociological nature, um, pure observations from my side, so personal observations, and some reflections coming um, also from research that I have been doing with several colleagues over the years. So when you look up mainstreaming in the dictionary, or at least when you Google it and the Cambridge Dictionary comes up, it says that mainstreaming is the process of making something start to be considered normal. And I'm so free to interpret normal in this context as stemming from the sociological term norm. So the norm referring to intersubjectively shared rules and expectations, so kind of an institutional concept. A normal, I guess, also in the sense of most common, something that has become um, statistically more likely than other things. And so I see, of course, a lot of institutions in there and a lot of the question of diffusion in there. And yes, that's, of course, because I'm tainted from my background of, of studying a lot of institutions. But I think this is also the angle I can probably offer um, the most useful reflections on. So bear with me on a little journey on how to understand mainstreaming from an institutional perspective, and especially from a perspective um, of a process of institutionalization and deinstitutionalization. And before everyone kind of in their head goes to the place where you think I'm going to talk about institutions, that's not what's going to happen. So I really want you to, to have in the forefront of your head the idea of a process of institutionalization institutionalization and deinstitutionalization of anything, of all types of sociotechnical elements, of sociotechnical configurations as a whole. So that's what I will be talking a little bit about now. Um, you might have seen this uh, 
uh, or seen me present this earlier, as Carolina said, also in, in uh, PhD schools. Um, that's because this is a, a little bit how I understand the process of institutionalization, how I usually think of it when I try to make sense of what's going on. And it is based on uh, on really classical sociology of knowledge and then that picked up by, by various institutional scholars looking at how can we describe that process? Do we see different types of stages of institutionalization? And therefore also can we understand institutionalization as a variable, meaning with different degrees? And um, especially uh, Berger and Luckmann have been really seminal in, in describing that process. Uh, going basically in these three stages that you see here, habitualization, objectification, and sedimentation. And in general, what they want to describe is a little bit how you get from, you know, language, having conversations with each other and shared experiences towards these experiences being passed down as knowledge in, uh, in later generations. And so the the, the process of institutionalization is a process that is reflected um, kind of as an increase of exteriority. So an increase in how much you think or you kind of take into account an environment as something that is objectively out there, that is external to your own social construction. And so the first step is they call it habitualization. It's the very early, so, and just to say, this is a little bit my interpretation of how they see um, a very complex sociological journey of how you get from language to, to shared norms, basically, in their, in their seminal book that I really, I, th I still think it's one of my favorite sociology books and I urge everyone to read it. Um, but how I will interpret it is very much for, for the sake also of, of transitions overall. So um, that being said, habitualization as a very first step in, in the process of institutionalization, looking at uh, kind of thinking of it as the, the stage of a very early on niche development. So where you have very few actors, very uncoordinated activity, there's no real consensus on theory, knowledge bases, values or users, and it's very unstable and, and impermanent. So these types of stages, um, they, they come and go throughout basically the day all the time. And then by putting a lot of work into it, meaning a lot of social construction ongoing, you can reach some form of objectification, meaning you see certain things develop, such as consensus, values, theories develop. Um, the discourse is usually in that stage very high. So a lot of people know about it. A lot of actors are starting to think they have to have an opinion on it. So we see a lot of discourse. The variance, the technological variance of, or the, the variance of the service, how something looks, the design, usually decreases in this. So it kind of, you know, gets to the point where you have some form of um, uh, agreement on, on how the, the thing should look like. And the users become a lot more heterogeneous. So it's not just the, you know, the first inside group that started it in the, in, in the habitualization phase, but now it can also be applied by people that were not in this first phase. And then again, with a big step of, um, of social construction, a lot of institutional work, um, whether or not and how intentional that is, is of course a little bit an ontological question, um, but in general, just people doing a lot of things and time going by, you can get to a form of sedimentation. And that's a stage where the idea is that you have some form of complete diffusion, if you will. I guess that would be the mainstream. Um, things become normative and um, especially also taken for granted. And you see less discourse, meaning that there's not really need to talk about it. There's a lot of agreement on that the thing is there, that it's legitimate. And, and maybe even people don't, if it's taken for granted, they don't even, you know, make it a topic. Um, and generally low resistance to it. And so I guess when we talk about transitions, we all very often talk about the, the change in socio-technical systems from regimes that seem very sedimented towards trying to see, okay, if we have these sedimented institutions, if we have these sedimented socio-technical configurations, the actor structures, the technologies, how do we get out of that? And how do we um, loosen that up, so to speak?
Um, so these are kind of the stages of, of institutionalization that one can think of also in, in, in your own empirics a little bit. Where is the, the system at? Where are diffusion processes at? And how can we, what kind of implication does that, that, does that then have on, on questions of, of change? And I have over the, the years really tried to come up with some more concrete ideas of indicators for the degree of institutionalization and have do done so in, in a few papers, but especially in a recent one together uh, with Johan and Christian. And Johan just presented that yesterday and we'll be keeping coming back to that paper. Um, we, we specified the a degree of institutionalization using, um, what is it, five indicators. Um, so for instance, um, so basically the question then is what makes something more institutionalized than something else? How, you know, when does something mainstream, so to speak? So one is quite obvious, it's the time span. Um, and uh, the assumption here that you can go from something existing for a short while and something existing forever. And every one of you that has ever worked in an organization that is really proud to be really old knows <laughs> what that kind of means. So there's a, a lot of past dependency usually in there. So the idea that something that exists long also has a lot of internal mechanisms for reproduction. Um, then the scope of diffusion. Um, the question of um, how widely something is applied or thought or used, and that can be, you can think of it as across geographies, but you can also think of it across sectors, across different issues, across just different organizational fields and socio-technical systems. We all know that certain technologies are used everywhere, and whereas other technologies are very specific, so I think that has implications on whether or not it's easy or not to get rid of a particular technology, for instance. Then there's a invulnerability to intervention. So the question of how easily can something be pushed away, pushed over, um, that is very closely connected to how much, yeah, the mechanism of reproduction that you that you find. Um, so there's Sociotechnical configurations, for instance, are rather vulnerable. Of course, that's assumed in the habitualization stage or even objectification stage, and then they can get very invulnerable. So even if a lot of people demonstrate it, even if a lot of criticism um, arises, even if a lot of people are against it or try to regulate it, etc., there seems to be a way to reproduction. Um, so that's that's definitely also one variable one could look at. And then there's starkness. That's more the question of how much dissent can we kind of detect in, in society, in a, in a particular system, in a particular field. So, of course, high dissent and controversy can indicate that something is in flux. Um, since at the very beginning and at the very end, it's usually that you don't have so much um, discourse going on. So the question of, as we have put it in, in one of my papers with Bernhard Schuffer, we have called that discursive hotspots and used it as a, as a way to identify areas where things are happening. And um, as you might have seen over the course of the conference, um, the people at EVOG are, are really working on that um, uh, more systematic discursive analysis as an indicator to to look at where do we see kind of hotspots of change and I think it it's really coming al along very well and clearly showing an indication of that something is happening so I really like that type of, of indicator for assessing degrees of institutionalization and then we have materialization and that's one that of course in STS and innovation studies we talk a lot about this um, whereas in institutional theory, they often forget about this. And the, the argument basically goes to say that if institutional um, elements or actors or any non-technological material artifact has also managed to materialize in some form, that that has impacts on the degree of its institutionalization. So the question of, for instance, um, when you have technological diffusion, is it first the technology and then you have all the so social and societal change? Or is it first the change um, in the institutional realm, for instance, and then you, you have the technology diffusing? And as we put forward in the SCRN community, I think a lot is that you have the co-evolution. And that, of course, is this materialization also um, that if 
a, a technology is never just a technology, for instance. So in, in sectors where you have big, large-scale, centralized infrastructure, such as water dams, it is just going to make a difference in terms of how easy you can get rid of that again. Um, so these are just some indications of, of how I see, at least, or how I think about the question of, of institutionalization and therefore also at least one part of mainstreaming. And that brings me to the other part. Um, let's see. Clicker is not going. Here we go. Yeah, so, sorry. Um, the um, an, an, an illustration I, I want to offer you um, about diffusion of very particular um, well, in that case, what we used is urban living labs. So the question of experiments, we can maybe also just say the question of niches. So the, the rather classical idea that institutionalization happens, um, you know, from small to big, from new to older. Um, and even if you look at this from that, you know, relatively generic point of view of diffusion that is so popular in so many social sciences, um, in this paper a few years back, um, that we wrote together with Timo von Wirt and Nikki Franciskaki and Lars Kuhnen, we tried to see whether or not we can um, have some form of idea of what kinds of diffusions there are when we look at niches, when we look at urban living labs and experiments. So the question of how can an experiment, for instance, have an impact on its context? And is there a way, can we see in the literature, in transition studies especially, some indication of whether or not there are different ways to, to see that question of mainstreaming, if you want. And um, so in the paper, we, we kind of try to flesh out three ideal types. And uh, let's start with embedding. So that's the idea that if you have, so the ULL is the urban living lab that we then also have empirical studies, if you're interested in it. Um, so when you have something like that happening very, you know, in a very specific place, often just a building or a street and something new, they try to come up with something new, some, some form of innovation. Um, what kind of diffusion patterns do we see? And I guess one is the embedding where there's a lot of work put in to try to make that innovation or the newness or the new socio-technical configuration somehow fit into the existing context. So the idea that if you want to be somewhat, if you want to have some form of impact, you need to pick up your surroundings into your innovation. You need to match it and mix it and try to align it with what's already there. And so that's the embedding idea that you have impact on your context, but you also need to pick up your context into your, um, your, for instance, your new socio-technical configuration. And that is, I think there's a lot of technology studies that have, have shown exactly this, like completely, you know, quite random and, and weird things of what has been kept uh, from previous technologies when new ones for the same functions were developed. I mean, to this day on an iPhone, you can have, you know, the, own, the, the old phone ringing. I'm not sure if, you know, young people even know what kind of, <laughs> what kind of ringtone that is. Um, so there's a, a little bit this question of how can we, you know, make the uh, divide between new and old smaller. So that's one way of how diffusion is achieved, um, at least in a, in a particular social space and social spatial context. And then there's the classic like scaling that's probably more common in, uh, in especially also economics and a lot of ideas today, I think, are driven by that. We just need to scale everything. We need to upscale. We need to make the thing that is good and that we have built just bigger. So there comes the idea that you have an experimentation um, such as the ULL, and that looks a certain way, has been developed in a specific social um, spatial context, and then you just make that one bigger. So you, you just enlarge its own structures. Um, and that, as you can see in this graph also a little bit, usually is just you, you design something new and make that bigger no, bigger no matter the external context. And then in the other case of translating, 
it's more the idea that you have the ULL and that it is very, you know, something special and new and uh, its own configuration. And then you try to scale that um, in the sense or mainstream that in the sense of um, translating into a different socio-spatial context. So let's say you have it in one city, you design something for Malmö in Sweden, and you realize this works really, really well, we should do this somewhere else. And as you can imagine, if you just transplant plant that into another context, that can be uh, sometimes completely the wrong thing to do. And so um, I think a lot of the times what we see is that there's a, um, a translation work going on where you try to take the new thing and make it your own in the next context, so to speak. So that's one um, example of diffusion I would like to leave you with. Now let's see if I can move the slides forward. Hmm. Now, I think, yes. Unfortunately, the phone goes on sleep mode, even though it's, I've ticked all the wrong boxes. Dear technical people, it's still happening. So um, sorry for those little interruptions. Um, before I want to go on to the rest of the conference theme, it's very important to me that to make the point that mainstreaming is not just a matter of institutionalization, which is often done, I think, also in transition studies, the classic idea of diffusion, our you know favorite S-curve that we have in, in so many studies. Um, and I want to point your attention to the question of deinstitutionalization instead. And so basically, I mean, it, it seems so natural, right, that for new things to institutionalize, other things need to disappear. And maybe that's not true in, in a, a few areas of our lives, but when it's about sustainability transitions, it's very often about that we actually want to get rid of certain things and replace them. So we don't want to just have more of you know, similar systems that have the same functions, but we actually also are interested of getting rid of some of the current existing systems. And so the, the big question becomes, how is the new and the old interrelated? And I uh, would like to say that I think we have quite an innovation bias um, in general in society where we kind of hope for the creative destruction that has been such a big thing. And I guess we as innovation scholars have all profited from that. Um, but it is very much a belief in society that as long as we just invest into, you know, new and better things, the old will somehow just go away. And I think we can clearly see now that this is not really the case. And I'm very happy to to see that there's a lot of really interesting work going on in transitions community um, to try to conceptualize the process of these institutionalization. And especially also the question of, if not innovation, what else might lead to the deinstitutionalization of current system? And I think that's a that's kind of the, the million dollar questions these days, because we have a lot of innovations that are waiting in the pipeline, but somehow the diffusion is not really going so well. Um, so we have, for instance, of course, work uh, on regime destabilization very early on uh, in, in Bruno Turnheim's PhD started that uh, together with Frank Heers. And we also have more and more um, work on phase out policies um, on discontinuation as a, of socio-technical systems as more of a governance problem. We have um, interesting work on deliberate decline for decarbonization and also the question of unlearning and unmaking. That's in, in particular unmaking in the sense of unmaking capitalism and focusing on how social movements are actually involved in reshaping some of the most underlying fundamental structures in our society. And then also um, questions of exnovation. Um, so the, the idea that it's not just innovation, it's also exnovation. And I think the one of the reasons why especially also policymakers, but we as a, as a whole in society 
are so struggling with this area of the institutionalization and focus so much, you know, rather on institutionalization and innovation. I think it's quite simple. It's just because it's really uncomfortable and it's really exhausting and it's very emotional and painful and sad and scary. And nobody likes, you know, uncertainties and you don't know if the next thing is not even worse than the one you already have and things like that. So I think it's we need to start thinking more about how to also come up with some form of security for that particular process rather for just you know the institutionalization process the innovation process because they do go hand in hand but one does not necessarily cause the other and i i really wish um also for myself that i'll be able to contribute to, to these topics in the next year a little bit more um looking at really can we get as much information on on how things end as we know how they come about um and so that brings me to, um, well, if we're not institutionalizing and not deinstitutionalizing, we have kind of the, the other only variant and that's stability or just things are not moving. And that's also what we see a lot, I guess. And I do think that it is really important um, to know kind of what makes things stable, and in our case, that's also technical systems, what makes them stable might actually allow us to figure out how do we need to change them. So how are the established structures reproduced and maintained, kind of trying to come up with the inner workings of the regime um, in order to find the leverage points that we need to say, like, okay, if this is how the system is continuously reproduced, maybe these are the things we need to start targeting. Um, from all all ends, not just through policy. And um, one attempt is this paper I already mentioned by Johan, Christian and I. Um, it is not meant for you to understand or see the graphs on um, this slide. It's meant as a teaser to see that especially Johan and Christian have invested a lot of time into making a lot of fancy round new graphs. And um, we have tried to operationalize a lot of things and kind of come up with the question, can we decode socio-technical systems to understand their transformation patterns and their transformation capacity? So is there something inherently in the like inherent in the system that can give us information about where to go and poke it and where to go and intervene and why some systems um, change in a particular way, why others um, in another. And so, of course, when we started this discussion, we um, started with the question of system elements. Um, are they important? And the answer is, yes, they're, of course, really important. It, it does matter whether or not you have particular actors, institutions or technologies. Like I said, materiality matters. Big technologies have different transformation patterns than, you know, small digital technologies or things like that. Um, multinational companies, really important, very different from family enterprises or state-led um, organizations. And also whether or not something is, of course, governed by regulative institutions or normative ones or a lot of cultural cognitive ones will make an impact. But our argument is to say that, yes, that is important, but it's not decisive for how the system changes. Instead, what we should look at is how these elements in the system relate to each other. So not what they are, sondern um, but how they are in relation to each other, how did they um, co-evolve over the years, so to speak. Um, so what we try to do is come up with some form of systemness. We want to just decode the systemness of systems, of socio-technical configurations. And we say that we need to look at the degree of institutionalization of a socio-technical configuration on the one hand relating to all the arguments I've made earlier in the presentation. But then on top of that, also the degree of their coherence. So the question of whether or not there's a, there's many or only a few of those configurations in a system. So do you have splintered regime situations? Do you have a lot of niche development? Do you have a lot of, you know, kind of half-baked socio-technical configurations on the rise? 
and depending on whether or not they are interrelating um, or uh, really conflicting or cancelling each other out or reinforcing each other, that that will have a lot to say about how the system moves forward. And then also the spatial characteristics, of course, working with geographers, that always comes in. And it's really important for degree of institutionalization and coherence to also say something about where does the socio-technical configuration actually lie? Where is it anchored? Where are its institutional elements? And where is it uh, you know, played out? Um, and I think, I hope that this is a first step to understanding stability a little better. So I really welcome you to go into the system and find our paper. It's very much, we have not submitted it yet. So if you have strong feelings about it, please get back to us. We're very happy to, to hear your thoughts and comments on that as well. All right. Um, so much for my thoughts on uh, um, mainstreaming, or how I think about mainstreaming, at least, or some of the thoughts that I think are sometimes a bit missing. And the next is mainstreaming transition, so from research to impact. And I would like to spend a little time thinking about research, what it is, and why it's important to, to maybe decode it a little before then going to the question of impact. So the first question I would, of course, kind of pose in the room, and if we were all together, I would maybe even, um, you know, would like to hear what you actually think about that. But the question of the difference between research and science, um, is it is there a difference or uh, are those two very different things? I'm sure you, we all know very convinced natural scientists who would never allow our social science disciplines to be called science. Um, I'm still in a university that has a science faculty, so that also says a lot about all the other faculties and the idea of, of what they do. Um, but either way, I would say it's uh, it, we can probably all agree on the fact that it's a very specific kind of knowledge that we're talking about and a very specific kind of expert that produces that knowledge. And these things uh, matter, um, especially currently in society, and I'm sure I'm not the only one that can diagnose a little legitimacy crisis in science research or actually that kind of knowledge and that kind of expert. And so I think, um, you know, we could name all types of politicians that have contributed to that, but I don't think it's that easy. So let's have a, a, a quick look on, on where that legitimacy crisis among other things, also comes from. And I think part of the issue is that we're, we claim to be a merit-based system. And I don't want to go into the fact whether or not we are that or not. We are an established system, that's for sure. Um, but if you say you're merit-based, you will always have, by actually by definition, by design, you have the idea of selection. So you want to select the best. And at the same time, the the... In the past years, we have seen, you know, such an awareness of inclusivity. And I think these are really hard to for the current systems to kind of bring together. So if we want to be the best and if we are so selective, what does that mean for being inclusive? Is it, you know, suddenly everyone can be part of that system? everyone should contribute to it? Or is it more a question of who do we choose? We need to define what merits are and we need to change the way we think about merits and we need to change the way we think about, you know, good research and good science and all of that. But either way, I think, you know, it would be very helpful for all universities to start thinking a little bit more about that uh, very particular conflict. Um, that at least I see in, in my little world arising a lot of times. And the other one is accessibility of knowledge. So I think as we have seen, especially during the COVID crisis, there's a real difference between knowing and believing. And I'm sometimes really ast astonished by especially English speaking uh, um, discourses around believing in science. I think that's a, that's just, that's to me, it just makes no sense, right? That should exactly not be 
it science should not be about believing it should be about knowing but the problem is that the structures have become you know very church like so you have a, a few people that know everything and they tell other people what they should believe and most people seem to not really have access to that knowledge and therefore it becomes a belief rather than knowing and i think we all have gone through that you know that moment inside of us when we started understanding a topic and we kind of kind of got confirmed that this is a real thing whatever it might have been um and then we just trust that people that do that it's not you know it's not a, a matter of believing it's just knowing that this type of knowledge gathering knowledge development actually you know makes sense and it's not only cor corrupted and it has nothing to do with assuming things out of the blue and it has nothing to do with believing in it and it's also not an opinion so i think the ac accessibility of knowledge is something that we need to take very seriously and not just you know as it's often done with the question of open access but it's it goes way more to the question of how many people do we get to a point where they don't think they believe in what other people say, but they actually feel like they at least start to know a little bit where those people are, are coming from. Um, and speaking about open access, um, I think it's just, for me, it's quite interesting how the conversation seems to have, especially within academia, kind of shifted towards open access being open access to publications. So that was, I think, at least at the beginning, the idea that, you know, everyone gets access to the publications, although I'm quite convinced that that's not the main problems. We, we have people and organizations taking care of open access problems, legally or not, is another question. But their knowledge is available. It's just it's not, it's not how you can consume it. Uh, very few people can just, you know, sit on their couch and read an academic publication and think now they know what's going on. So there's a lot more to the to the knowledge development, and I will say something about that in a in a few minutes also. But then the discourse has somehow gone towards open access to publishing, and we had a a, a little um, dialogue session on academic publishing where these things came up during this conference. You know, the question of who's allowed to publish where and who makes the decisions over what is good research and where to publish and what is going to be taken for granted as a solid source. Um, and I think this is a, a conversation that we really need to have. And it goes back to the merit-based system of selection versus inclusivity. Um, since science and research are based on selection, it will never be um, the idea of be fully inclusive of everyone who wants to. And we see that happening with a lot of, uh, you know, personal initiatives to, um, to proclaim the scientific label on a lot of just statements and opinions. And I think um, it would be nice if we could have a more differentiated a discourse about that development and I think STS, if nothing else, has really a lot to offer on that topic. Furthermore, I think research has a bit uh, a truth dilemma, especially when it comes to impact. Unfortunately, the most influential theories are not necessarily true and it has never, oops, and it has never been the idea that um, so, you know, going back to maybe Luhmann having the idea of there's this scientific system that have, that is self-referential and has its own idea of, of how to um, reproduce itself. It's not, it has nothing to do with being true, um, the things that get very popular. And I think, especially in social science, I think maybe natural science functions a bit different in that regard. Um, but we have seen this over and over and over again. Though. We have a lot of really influential thinkers um, that, especially in the past, never were questions about any of their evidence and their methodology and their data and whether or not it's really true. And, uh, and I think that's also something that we have to think a little bit more about, especially when 
policymaking is now so open to receive all type of evidence-based suggestions on what to do. And here we are, and we have a completely different tradition of working with evidence and coming up with a, a discourse and, you know, pushing or disqualifying certain ways of thinking or just leaving them be and sit next to each other. Um, so the question I want to leave you with on the, on the question of research is, Basically, can the current scientific system actually produce the knowledge and experts that is relevant to sustainability trans uh, transitions? Or is it as much an incumbent system that needs to transition in order to be able to see the right problems and suggest useful solutions? So it's always a bit baffling to me that many of us think that all the other systems have to change and they're all blind and they can't really see it but somehow our own system from which we make all these assumptions and, and the um, claims um, seems to be very stable, probably one of the most stable ones in, in the history, next to, what is it, church and military? All right, so impact. From research to impact. And I'm sure you kind of expect me to talk about policy and about all the interactions in which we need to mainstream our research and how to get it out in the world. And also because I work with a lot of policymakers and I think this is very valuable work. And I also think there's there has been so many presentations in this conference looking at exactly that question. And also we have had quite a few policymakers in the audience or people working for Climate Kick and OECD and the EU Commission. So I'm really um, leaving that particular topic to them. Instead, I want to talk about a really way more traditional form of impact. And that's teaching. And I'm a bit disappointed in my own, uh, well, in my own academic lifestyle, how teaching has, um, or academic career so far, how teaching has become very devalued in certain in certain areas um, in society, and especially the ones um, that are evaluating us, or are, are evaluating teaching as something negative very often. And so the first question I want to kind of put into the room is, when did teaching become disconnected from impact? Because last I checked, teaching is mainstreaming. Teaching is one of the most important forms of institutional work you can have. It's how we create our human resource society-wide. And so teaching is mainstreaming and mainstreaming is having impact. So I really, really want to urge everyone to put the education and learning back on the table and our work as um, as teachers to, to also be more proud of that and invest our time and think about at the university level of what that actually means um, to start talking about teaching as something that you want to avoid and then complaining that nobody has the human resource that can do anything in any organization outside the academic system. And so the, and I'm sure that you've all probably made this uh, this uh, experience yourself. I remember when I talked, when I studied still, and we talked to some of the, you know, Ivy League professors in sociology. Um, most of them, when you ask them what they did, was to say they were teachers, and they were really proud of that. And they looked the part, and they, you know, they they also produced really great research. But first and foremost, they really understood themselves also as then bringing that knowledge to somewhere else, and that's through teaching. And the second question is, when did teaching become disconnected from research? And that question, I don't know how much, that's a personal reflection. Um, I work at Lund University, and I teach at the University of Lucerne in Switzerland. And that's, a, in Lucerne, it's a, it's, a, it's a sociological department where I originally did my bachelor's and my master's, and I still have really close ties to them. And the teaching there is organized around the person that's teaching. So when I teach, I can pretty much quite freely 
decide on what I want to teach. And so I can pick up really, you know, the latest things that I am thinking about in research. I will teach this autumn and it will be about endings. It will be about deinstitutionalization. It will be about all of these things that I think should be researched currently. And I want to, you know, engage the students very early on in these topics. And in Lund, on the other hand, big university, traditional, you know, big apparatus, as we all know. And um, the teaching um, is organized quite disconnected from who's working there. So the courses almost have their own lives and there's course plans and somebody put them up and then you can't change them for years to come. And it's very, you know, it's legal and not legal and this and that. And it has very much, and, and it, it's almost impossible to change anything in the curriculum. So, you know, bringing in new types of thinking, bringing in sustainability transitions. I still haven't managed I'm at this university for, what is it now, six years, and I have not managed to get a master's course or anything on the topic of sustainability transitions. I can manage a few lectures here and there, but, and the, the reason for that is that in order for someone to make a new master's course, someone else's needs to get dropped. And you can imagine that that's not really a, you know, socially acceptable situation. So therefore, the more we can disconnect teaching from the research that people are actually doing, I think we will always get stuck in very traditional university curricula and that's that's detrimental. And I really urge you to go to your university and look at the curricula and see what it is we're teaching the next generation. And then we don't have, to, if we already now educate the next generation on things we already now know that we do not want to have further down the road, it just, it, that makes no sense to me that there's no movement in that area, that we're still training a whole generation to do things in a way that we're advocating it, they shouldn't be done like that. And so the third question with teaching is what do we know that can be taught in general? So ways of thinking rather than results. And that's a bit of a provocative question, of course, because it's not so apparent to me what kind of transition research should be mainstreamed. It's not completely apparent to me what we know as a community that can be, you know, just taught. It's not like we can say, this is the system. This is are the relevant things that you need to know. But I do firmly believe that we have a particular way of thinking that we should be um, teaching the, the students. And for that, we need to get into the curricula. And then the other question, the last one, who are we teaching? And for whom are we teaching? So in many of the places I have been teaching, there's a big discussion about students versus customers. Some have starting to, started to teach students as customers, wanting to make them very happy. And as soon as that becomes the case, we are a demand-driven um, enterprise. And I think that will kill any form of innovative thought because it would mean that we think that somebody that starts to study already knows what they're supposed to be taught. And I think that's we should really counteract that and, and find a dialogue, especially also with the students, to let them know that they can have a lot of opinions and they can shape the curricula and they can you know, bring themselves in but they should also accept that there's a, a little bit, maybe, you know, the, the, the moment of surprise when you sit there and say, I didn't know about this, and now I know about this, and I think this is relevant. So what makes us think that, you know, students know what they're supposed to be learning? And I, I really think this is, we should all as teachers fight for, for keeping our own agenda a little bit, at least to, to see, um, you know, where we, that we can safeguard what we actually do want to, to teach. And then for whom? Because, and I have this conversation with policymakers a lot, with Vinova in Sweden, always this, you know, the claim, we should, as academics, tell them what to do now, and we should provide the knowledge. And my point is, well, why don't you just hire the people that we educated? 
Now we have about a generation of people that know about transitions and they have gone through our courses. And I can really assure you that they know things and maybe you should hire them. And they have started doing that and that has really also changed um, the way my work is with them. If I can work with people that is, are educated in in the, the language and the, the phenomenon that we're studying, etc., um, and I think we should also, you know, be really adamant that we want to have a human resource that knows about our way of thinking. All right, one last uh, reflection, some one last slide on what does it all mean for transitions. Um, yeah, the big question: What do we want mainstream? Um, is it transitions that we want to mainstream, or is it transition research? And that brings me, of course, to the little bit of painful question, probably to all of us: Is transition research needed for transitions to happen? And if so, what kind of knowledge is needed, and who can produce that knowledge? And while I believe I'm a firm believer in, in like epistemic communities and communities of practice, and I think we have to play a role there, I'm not so convinced that transition research is really, you know, what's needed for transitions to happen. Um, and this, the thing that I said with things that are true versus things that work, we all know evidence-based is great, but even greater is if, for instance, policymakers can take a a concept and run with it and do their own with it. And it's quite frightening sometimes <laughs> what's happening to our uh, things, but sometimes it still seems to work. So it doesn't matter whether or not it was intended like that. If it works in a different context for what it has been intended, maybe that actually is also a really good thing. And back to the teaching, I think teaching opportunities are essential. Teaching needs to be rewarded in the CV. It's not the opposite of research. It is the, the main way that we as a community can mainstream our knowledge. So please make sure to keep up teaching in those areas in as many universities as we can. Let's not be kicked out by all the other disciplines. And the last point again, mainstreaming needs deinstitutionalization and we need strategies for it. So let's start thinking about how deinstitutionalization happens without only referring to innovation. All right, I thank you very much for, for your attention and I'm so looking forward to all your, your questions and critical comments. I hope I provoked enough. Thank you, Leah, so much for your inspirational keynote, for raising so many important questions, for going all the way from mainstreaming to unpacking our research, the institutionalization to teaching and give, putting that center stage as well. So big thanks to you. And now we turn to the questions. Um, as everyone knows, there is um, a Q&A tool, so you can put in your questions and you can also upload questions. And we already have several in there, so I'm just going to get right started, Leah. Um, we're starting with research and that part of your talk. Um, Hannah is asking, giving your comments um, regarding research, um, what do you think of the decolonization work in academia? Is it relevant to transitions work? And if so, how? Yeah. Um Definitely relevant. I think I, I forgot to mention it, but the pictures that were there um, on the slide, it's um, a, a book on the end of the cognitive empire. I'm looking at it right now in my shelf. Um, it's uh, De Sousa Santos who has written that. It's, it's a great inspiration. And then there's also Saura Aurora and Andy Sterling at Spru who have started to work on the question of the pluriverse. So a little bit... Um, how, how can we allow for more plurality in, uh, in our understandings of, of how we see the, the world? So a little bit more the question of how do we deal with different ontologies when we have them at the same table? So yes, um, I think it's really important um, to, to include that and reflect on it when we talk about sustainability at the end, yes. And I think we also saw that when you designed the methods um, PhD school, that this was a topic which was on the um, curriculum for that um, school. So the next question is uh, moving us to um, academia. And um, the question is, what might a transition in academia look like? Do you have some ideas? 
Well, um, I'm going to repeat the point I made uh, yesterday in the uh, in the session, the dialogue session we had, that I think academia, as opposed to many other systems, is a very we manage to be quite excluded from a lot of external pressures. I'm aware there's a lot of external pressures or it feels like that for many people, but compared to other organizations, there is actually quite a big freedom for many people on how to, you know, run their work. And I think we have, you know, used the last uh, centuries to establish our very arrogant uh, view that nobody else really knows what we're doing and therefore shouldn't have an opinion on how to run our business. And I think for once we should maybe turn that a bit around and say, well, yeah, but now our business seems to be sometimes a bit, you know, to the point where nobody really start and is enjoying it anymore. There's a lot of complaints about being overworked. There's a lot of complaints about, you know, too many publications. Nobody has time to read. The quality goes down, all of these things. And at the same time, people that, that complain about that are the same that ask me to submit my CVs and, you know, I'm always criticized for being not a productive enough scholar. And they mean I'm not doing, I'm not publishing enough. And they can say this to me. And at the same time, they say, I don't think publishing is particularly relevant or, you know, the amounts of, of publication, it should be rather insightful ones or, but bringing that together might be a first start. So people that are in positions of authority, you have you have it in your hands to say, okay, no, it stops with me. I'm going to start looking at other things that I think are important. So that's the first step. I would urge you to at least have the discussion around it, see if we can agree on some of the main flaws and the ones in power. Just, yeah, understand that you are in fact in power. Um, that's uh, really a nice notion for all of us um, to use our own agency that we have. Uh, we may be coming back to this, but I'm just going to go um, to the um, upvoted question from Bruno. Um, he's saying translation is central to mainstreaming. And then um, he's referring to Callum who says um, translating is also betraying. And he included the Italian um, um, version of that. Um, who will be betraying by mainstreaming, or yeah, who will we <laughs> be betraying by mainstreaming transition? Yeah, that well, I guess there's embedding, there's scaling, and there's translating that will always mess up the the original idea, right? There's there's so many compromises along the way, and we will all have to make these trade-offs of whether or not to to be in alignment and to be heard and to be taken seriously, which always takes some, uh, you need to pick people up somewhere um, versus be radical. And uh, I think a lot of people have written about that, that dilemma. It has a name now, I, I forgot about it, but how radical something is and whether or not it's ever gonna be picked up. So yes, that will be, and we see it already happening in transition studies. What, um, what happens if a field professionalizes? What happens if a field, um, you know, institutionalizes? There, it's going to have vested interests. It's going to have um, motives and values that are not in line with what originally the thought was. Whether or not that's necessarily a bad thing or whether or not that's better than nothing, I'm not really sure about. And maybe I just um, lead us um, to the question from Daniel in terms of deinstitutionalization, and um, in terms of you raising the notion that um, that's probably safer or certain um, to make it safer or certain deinstitutionalization. What kind of relationship do you see um, with equity and justice, and what is the potential here? Yeah, huge potential, right? I think there's a there's this weird thing happening in society all the time when it's about change, that people, even people that are really currently screwed by the system are somehow afraid of change because they don't know whether or not afterwards it might be worse. But of course, if we do sustainability transitions right, it's going to be better for so many people. And I hope we can find a way through, you know, narratives, through the construction of storylines, through just 
getting to the heart of people that they understand that they can almost only win. But, you know, I'm from Switzerland. We have a lot of um, uh, direct democracy, so we vote on a lot of things. And so I know that you can, you know, we just a few years back have voted on uh, one more week of vacation and it got turned down. We voted on parental leave for fathers, got turned down. We voted on um, basic income, got turned down. So people, even though most people would actually benefit from it, the fear of change is, is bigger because at least now you know your misery and you know how to navigate it. And I think trying to come up with new storylines and make people see that most people will benefit and it's actually really a, a very few corporations only that will have less profit, maybe. That, uh, but for people in general, it's, it's going to only be good. And that just needs to be understood so that the voting results change. Um, I'd like to move us back to teaching. Um, we have a question from Bipashi and in terms of your experience with um, teaching MSc students versus policymakers. Um, when you're training um, policymakers, do you like, differentiate between lecturing to um, students like, who take like, their masters and policymakers? And if you should differentiate, how should they be different or similar? <laughs> Yeah, well, I would say it depends uh, of the background of the policymakers. Um, so if they're not, I mean, a lot of policymakers are not particularly, you know, they, they didn't go far in school necessarily. So their knowledge is, is of a different kind of nature. Sometimes they have not come so close into contact with academics and the academic knowledge and the type. So if that's the case, then, I mean, you know, we're talking first first semester. Um, so that kind of pedagogical, like trying to, to not, you know, it's not about content. It's about trying to teach someone how you think and why you think a certain way. And I think that is, or that's usually what I try to do when I get first year students in sociology. I think that's you know, I, there's one, I think it was Anthony Giddens who said once you, or he has an introduction book on sociology, which is very rare in sociology that you have like these introductory things. And But because he's Anthony Giddens, I think he, he is allowed to have one. And so I think he has this one line at the beginning that says like once, kind of a warning, once you see the world through these eyes, you can never unsee it. So be aware. And I think that's the same approach that I would take to teaching anyone. Like it needs to, to start with seeing where they are. And then you, you move from very broad understanding of who we are and how we see the world towards very, very detailed content question. But yeah, policymakers, it's not, their age doesn't matter. Their academic age kind of matters. And that's where I would start to pick them up. Thanks for, for this. Um, and we stay with um, teaching and the aspect that you raised that teaching is so um, yeah, valued little um, in, in academic careers. And um, to what extent do you um, do the problems that you raise in this regard relate to over-specialization and disciplinary silos? Um, yeah, um, Danny also asked the link to um, previous discussions. Yeah, it's. I think that's a difficult question. Um, I can just give, like most of what I say here, very personal reflection. I'm not a big. I'm a, a big fan of interdisciplinary um, engagements, but I just think in terms of time, it is not possible to understand a certain discipline if you do not put in enough time. So it's to me, it's a bit weird that you would think a normal degree in sociology or associated things, it's five years. What happens to someone that has one year? There's not that many people that can, you know, just wing it, that don't need the time to read up on it. And so I think there's a difference between being locked 
in your discipline and being proficient in it. I think you can be proficient in something, but ne nevertheless have gone out and met other people every now and then and have understood how they think. And so, yes, I think I'm always in favor of having different um, type of, of uh, educations throughout um, our whole schooling career. But I don't think we get around to, to specializing in, in, uh, in some parts to actually get the expertise we need. Mm. So I would, yeah. One, one of the things I truly enjoy about teaching at Spruce is like really make students see this world through the interdisciplinary eyes, but it takes time and um, yeah, for us like a year until they get there and then yeah, it's true, they, they see the world totally differently then. Um, we stay with, with teaching and there's a question from Pranusha in terms of um, what if we have students who are not so interested in social science part, um, how could we teach them social sciences even if they're themselves not so motivated, how can we make it attractive? Well, I teach a lot in engineering at Lund. I'm based in the engineering faculty. I don't know. Um, I mean, first of all, I think you need to, I mean, it's a real pedagogical work, right? You, you can't come in and present your slides, basically, because you're, you're dealing with almost first graders. Um, so I, I teach people that uh, are specializing in something, there, I think it's called management and innovation or something. So it's like the pinnacle of, I like to call it, sorry if any of the students are here, but it's a little bit the pinnacle of arrogance. So you get the management side and the engineering side and they have both and they combined it and they all want to become CEO. If at the beginning of the course I ask them, you know, why are they taking these types of innovation courses? They always say that they want to become CEO and therefore, and I always think like CEO of what? Like it's so fascinating to me that you can feel so superior in your knowledge base, right? But that's, of course, because engineering and economics are the superior <laughs> sciences in today's society. And so, to be honest, it's a, it's, a, it's a matter of convincing them. And I think we have really great case studies to convince them. And my experience is that there's always going to be a few that are convinced and they're really interested and they stay with you throughout their um, education. They ask to, you know, write their master thesis and... Um, and these are the, that's kind of, you know, a lot already if you get a few of them interested. And the, it, it, not everyone needs to be interested in that. We need people that are really good at, you know, building things and coming up with new materials and coming up. And they don't necessarily also have to feel necessarily forced to engage in all types of societal questions. So I'm not too worried about the ones that, that are not interested. I think that's legitimate to a certain degree, but I do think we need to make pedagogical effort to, to get the ones that are interested. And you can't just start with, you know, sociology, uh, 101 institutions, institutional logic, and just basically replicate your IST um, presentation in a master's course. That doesn't work. So it takes time again. Thank you. Then um, there's a question on truth, the truth dilemma, and if you could um, elaborate a little bit more on that. Well, I think from transition studies, we have seen, you know, a little bit competition of frameworks, for instance. So we see the competition between MLP and TIS, and uh, we see the competition, competition between policy frameworks. Is it now transformative innovation policy? Is it mission orientation? Is it whatever else is out there. And the things that diffuse to policymakers, the things that they put up when we interact with them or when they consume our knowledge, it's, it, it's a bit hard to say what, you know, what will uh, get their attention. And then they can take something and they run with it. And they really, you know, they promote it as the newest thing. And maybe we all have internally the discussion that that's actually, you know, the it's it's not that there's a superior way of looking at this. It's not what the evidence says. It doesn't actually add up. But that doesn't necessarily matter if they can use a term or if they can, you know, use a particular illustration to make their point in their organization. It doesn't matter whether the MLP is, you know, the the best way of describing a transition. It works really well 
for them inside their own organization to simplify. They have their own MLP version. I'm think, I'm, I think maybe once we should make an effort to just collect all the MLP like you know, like graphic representations that have been done over the years. I think that would be really, really fun, especially probably also for Frank to see what people do with with that original idea. And then it, I don't know. Does it matter whether it's true, whether it, whether that's actually what it was intended, whether it's you know, it's just it, for some people it works, and then they use it. And so it's it's this old sociology communication thing. You cannot not communicate. So you need to just let it go what happens on the other end. It's very hard to control that. Maybe Frank already has a collection on, on this, um, but um, if you come across others, maybe send it to him and he can compile it and share maybe at the next IST conference. Um, I already, um, yeah, um, see, I see the new questions now, great. Um, <laughs> Open access. Um, you mentioned that open access is more about the consumption of knowledge rather than access. Um, could you please tell a few ways to improve the consumption as Arabic? As in, uh, I'm not sure I completely understand the, the question. I mean, the what I wanted to say is that I don't think that the access to our scientific publication solves the problem of accessing what we know. Um, I mean, and that brings me back to interaction and teaching and, you know, taking the time to, um, to, to spend with people, trying in all possible ways to, to bring about a message. I think a lot of, I mean, maybe you know that a little bit with, there's, there's a really great um, kind of summary articles in a lot of social science about a certain um, theory, let's say. I mean, in organization studies, there's there's dozens of books that just some, you know, this is institutional theory, this is network theory, this is um, population ecology, this is whatever else. And then they have, you know, it's about 20 pages and it's really condensed and it has everything you need to know about that in there. And for me, at this stage, this is great resource. You know, I, I see it as, oh, this is perfect. Everything is there. If I give this to a student, they will not understand a word because it's it's on a it's on a wrong level for them. They need to go back and, and read the primary literature, see how people got to the point of making this because in the summarized one, everything is really condensed and every word has a meaning, etc. And so I'm not convinced that it's a matter of access to our scientific publication. I think we have a lot of issues with access to scientific publication and the publishing system, but in terms of spreading the knowledge, I'm not sure that's the key one. I think there's, uh, it, even if you would have everything open access, and to be honest, I do think you find everything um, these days online. I'm not sure that that really solves access, but maybe I'm, I'm completely mistaken and I'm happy to be corrected for that as well. Personally, I'm very much in favor for, for open access. I don't really understand uh, how we ever got into the system that we thought it was a good idea to give away our knowledge like that. Yeah, good point. And but then also the point that you raised earlier, then if people have access to the articles, who can understand it outside of academia? Um, so we still need to translate that. Now, um, your linking impact to teaching has raised a lot of um, interest. And so I have another question on, on that in terms of um, teaching sustainability transitions. Um, it's so important, um, but our universities, many of them at least, don't seem to seize this opportunity. Um, so what can we do? Where could we potentially go? Open universities, global universities, maybe NEST, is there a role for, for, for that? Um, what do you think? Yes. Um, so it's, as I mentioned in my own university, it's a huge problem to get this um, into the early stages. And I would urge really everyone to work that we get this, not just at the master level. We need to have it from the start. You know, it needs to become mainstream curricula. Um, so it's a bit weird. I get a lot of engineers there in their last year. They've never heard of it. You know, they've never even had to discuss any form of systemic impact of whatever technology they might be developing down the line. And in their role as CEO and all their consultancies. So I think 
I would really hope that we get it in the basics, so as early as possible. Um, but anything helps. And yes, the PhD community really is, I think it's phenomenal. You guys at Nest do such great work. And I mean, the resources that you have created, I would have loved to have this as a PhD student. And I really think um, we're trying to, you know, add on to that. And um, it's great to have so many volunteers that um, that just dedicate a lot of their time to, to try to make the knowledge accessible. And um, I think that's really important because it's sometimes also quite hard for us in the more senior roles to really understand in which way we can help the PhD community best. So I think their efforts have been have been tremendous. But it would be nice if that's not, you know, if people don't hear from about sustainability transitions the first time in their PhD studies. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Um, so get this more into the undergraduate curriculum. Um, the next question gets that closer to, um, oh, we just had a jump up. Um, so, and now the question I want to ask is gone, but then uh, on top, can um, the or institutionalization processes be sped up somehow? So can we accelerate them? And the, the person asking the question is linking this to the keynote yesterday where we have she seen a disconnect between our problems and how fast societies change. So do you think it can be accelerated, the, what you talked about in terms of deinstitutionalization and institutionalization? Yeah, that's what everyone wants to know. Can you can you force that change? Yes and no. Yes, I do think you can in certain areas do that, but you need to be really wary of the consequences of it. And we, because the more you you know you you force change, the more people will not be on board, and that will give you huge democracy and legitimacy crises. And I think that can maybe lead to the bigger backlash than just trying first to get enough people on board. But that said, there's a lot that can be done on many levels where, you know, most people are not not engaged. There's not a societal discourse in, in that sense where a lot of the things are decided on, on, on high level um, executive boards and with policymakers, et cetera. So I think there is actually quite a big room for for commitment on that level that has nothing that would you know where we could also use a lot of examples to actually show and demonstrate that was also um, a point made in in last uh, in the keynote yesterday the, the question of um, demonstration and I completely agree with that it's what I meant by people don't you know they this thing with just believing in something is really problematic that will not really because then it becomes very religious and it will also work as a religion you use it to split the society you use it to make sure um, you're right and somebody else is wrong based on absolutely nothing right that's what beliefs usually do and I think we have enough evidence um, in history that believing is, is, is not really the way forward. Um, so it should be about the know, knowing and having the trust and especially being able to imagine. And so all the new ways of trying to translate the future, I think that's really cool. I mean, there's so many great examples of, of how, for instance, yeah, I like this in one of the EU projects, um, they had um, like a they, they made this, what was it called, Notre Dame, I think, like this uh, virtual uh, or just a, an imaginary travel guide for a city in the future. And, um, you know, they had science fiction writers included and people that know how to come up with stories. And I think that's the type of, you know, broadening the expertise and the knowledge and including people that would really help us to um, to get people to understand what it is. But so I think there's a trade-off, uh, and I would be a bit wary with replacing um, acceleration with democracy. Yeah, important point raised there, but also a neat idea for um, future research projects. Um, so staying um, or coming back to teaching, um, 
David says teaching is neglected at IST um, because policy change is more effective um, than changing personal behavior, and that's a question for sustainability transition. So is policy change more effective than changing personal behavior within the field of sustainability transitions or for sustainability transitions? He asks, do we need to share more material on pedagogy? Um, I mean, I, I didn't necessarily mean that teaching is not included in IST, like in the conference per se, but I think, yes, there should be more talk about how do we um, paint, how are different ways of knowing um, constructed? And I mean, we had a, just before this keynote, a dialogue session on knowledge infrastructure for transitions. And I think that's, you know, where, where it's about building up community of practice and, and having a, a place where you can exchange ideas. And Tipsy has been vital in over the past years in, in trying to bring a lot of policymakers across the world together. And so I think there's a lot we can do to figure out how do we convey knowledge outside of the traditional academic lines because that speaks to academics and I think we're all convinced right so um, there's definitely room for that um, that said um, I mean policy change and, and personal change whatever behavioral change whatever that really is I think it goes hand in hand so the way I think about you know interventions it's more it's a matter of timing of the process of institutionalization. So if you have a policy coming in um, when there's no foundation for anything in society, I don't think that will take root. But even more so, I don't think that policy would come about. Because until policy comes about, there's a lot of development in society already happening that, you know, at least in that part in the system has already been, you know, going through so many motions for somebody to actually push through something else. I mean, every policymaker can can tell you, you know, their life's work and just, you know, we it took 20 years to get us to do it like that. And um, so I think it's a bit of a matter of finding the right um, phase for the right type of intervention and that can be regulative through policy that can be in the normative sense or a lot of like voluntary regulation standardization and of course there's a cultural change that is a culmination of all of these things and I don't dare to say there's a system where we can detect how it works and where it works and which one you know needs to be done when I think it's a little trial and er error there but uh, yeah Thanks for that clarification. And um, we also had some suggestions, like developing a MOOC, perhaps maybe a possibility, as well as having a dialogue session, perhaps next year at, or at the next IST, um, to look more into teaching. Um, now I have a question um, that um, goes um, into the direction, what takes more time, Leah? Um, it comes from Nuno, and he asks, innovation formation or discontinuation? Then which one takes more time? Or co-evolution of technologies? and practices versus deinstitutionalization. Which one takes more time? Oh, I don't know. I don't have uh, I don't have an answer to that. Um, I think empirical data would suggest uh, deinstitutionalization since we see nothing happening in, in a lot of uh, um, since a lot of years despite the, the talk around it. So I think uh, I mean theoretically if you would answer this theoretically, you would assume that something that is highly institutionalized is, of course, really hard to get rid of compared to especially innovation in these days where we have so many neat ways to protect. So all the, you know, the, the niche protection going on and all the research funding, development funding, a lot of the big organizations have their like innovation um, kind of they have a part it's it's more than organizational slack these days they have a whole team that is just you know left alone to just have good ideas and things like that so a lot of these things have have been institutionalized so that we are actually better and really good at putting forward innovations um but if we're talking about getting rid of something that there's a lot of resistance to that's a whole different question right the same is with diffusing an innovation that, that people don't want, it's going to be hard. Um, so I think it it goes in both ways, but theoretically, deinstitutionalization 
probably quite a heavy thing. Mm. Yeah, thank you. And now a very um, provocative question. <laughs> Um, is academia redundant in our societies? And the question is coming from your separation of transitions research from transitions, um, saying that that questions the very utility of academia. So do you think academia is redundant in our societies? Absolutely not. Um, I'm uh, an academic, so uh, I truly believe in knowledge and the way we in academia also these days develop knowledge. Um, and the type of rigor that we put to our thoughts and to our data and to our um, kind of presentation of the world. But I don't think it's, it's the only institution that generates knowledge that is necessary and that is relevant and that is legitimate. That I don't disagree with. So this, um, you know, that thing that people currently seem to invoke a lot when they say, well, but it's scientific. That is, that as an STS scholar at heart, that's the worst thing that somebody can say, you know, where when you think like there's a truth and the scientific truth, I mean, the science is all about progress and about, you know, going further, which at the end means you, you try to disprove things, but it doesn't mean that what we put forward is anything goes or it's not true or it's, it doesn't, you know, like that type of deconstruction of science is, is completely wrong and useless to me, but also the other way to just say that science is the holy grail of all things and that's the only way um, we can make sense of society and it's the only thing we should ever follow. Most of life is not explained by science and so I think People notice that, of course, and we should find a way to delineate a little bit where we can make an impact and we can have knowledge and we can have expertise, but that doesn't mean that we run the world. I think this is a very slippery um, slope. And I think, yeah, many, like historically, we have seen that that usually does not go well. You compared academia as a very stable institution with things such as church and religion. So there's a question on this. Um, do you think um, ontologies of science are different from religious beliefs and in what ways? Um, I hope they are. Uh, I think uh, in in theory they're, they're different um, because of the fact of replication that should be able to be done by everyone. However, in practice, there since we have this disconnect where some people, you know, I always think about this, that usually there's like one and sometimes even no person in between me and the government. So this idea of that, for instance, the government is putting out some restrictions or the government and they and, and a lot of people feel very far away from that right and the, the way a lot of us have operated is we feel very close to that because we have had interactions and sometimes you know it's not even seven nodes to knowing all the world it's really it's very very few and we're act, we feel empowered and active in shaping the discourse and in shaping where things are going but if that starts to fall away we can get into a situation where people perceive science and academia as almost the same, you know, like far away as church, as inaccessible to them, as useless, as untrue, as betraying, um, as not worth following and listening to. And uh, I think that has a lot to do with competence in uh, in understanding what it is we're doing. And I hope through, you know, really trying to get people more, yeah, educated everywhere that this should, uh, this should hopefully subside a little bit. But at the same time, the arrogance of academia also needs to subside. Good point. Um, we are getting closer towards the end, so maybe just a couple of final questions. Um, and there's one that has been upvoted quite a lot. So um, this is about, do you think the innovation bias um, in sustainability transitions and in society um, is related to meta discourses um, around growth? 
yeah, so the link to um, growth, um, and if so, is this an important leverage point? Yes, innovation and growth are very linked because it's innovation is seen as the reason for economic growth or how nation states and firm can have competitiveness. Um, that's definitely very ingrained as one of the, I don't want to call it a myth, I'm not going to um, make a judgment around it, but it has been the predominant guiding principle and it has you know, it has created a lot of wealth for a lot of people and a lot of countries and it has had a lot of uh, um, tremendous impact. And so the question of growth and degrowth, um, um, I think I'm quite on the, on the page with um, some of the speakers in the past days. We need both. And uh, you can also think of innovation as a tool for degrowth. There's, it depends on the innovation. It depends on, on what kind of product or service practice you put into, into the world that will um, define whether or not we're having growth or degrowth. And, but at the end of the day, it's, uh, it, it is our historical legacy that these things are connected. So we probably would have to show whether or not they are or whether or not they're not and whether or not you can have innovation for degrowth and whether or not growth can happen without innovation. So I think um, it's an empirical question and we should definitely research it. Thank you, Leah. And those who want to look more into this can look at the recording um, of yesterday from the special session um, on degrowth um, with several um, contributions. I think it was a dialogue session. Leah, we've come to the end um, of the <laughs> keynote. <laughs> Thanks so much for answering this big variety of questions and also being following like up and down from academia to um, teaching and back. Um, a big, big back of mixed questions. Thanks for your really stimulating keynote. I enjoyed it a lot. Um, so yeah, if we had, can we give an applause here from at least from us? Thank you, Carolina. And thanks guys for organizing the conference this year. Great work. Yes, thank you so much, Leah, again, for, uh, for holding this super interesting keynote. Carolina, thank you so much for the moderation of the keynote. Looking forward to seeing you next time, Leah. Bye-bye. Uh, so now I'd like to welcome back again 